Does that make sense? Good. Any questions to that before we keep going in our topics? Because today we're going to talk about dentistry. So how is that? Well, it used to be one of my boring topics for me, but I kind of like it now. It's, um, we're going to talk about matter, about energy a little bit. We talk about some atoms. We just go to the orbital model. We don't go too deep in this stuff. We just do what we need to know for our physiology. So mostly it's like high school, I think, level-wise. Um, and then we got the interactions of atoms creating molecules, and also that's where we talk about <laughs> bonds. And that's a, that's a very important topic for us. And then we talk about the types of chemical reactions. And then from there, we jump into biochemistry. We'll see how far we get if we do some of that. Matter is everything that occupies space and has weight. So that's the pen, that's the table, that's the shoe, everything that we can touch. Matter comes in different states, chemically speaking. Um, and the best way to look at that is with water. Matter, water is matter. Water can be solid, as in ice, or as in liquid, we can be liquid, as in water. Or when we boil it off, it gives you a gas. So we have solid, liquid, and gas. Those are the three states of matter. And pretty much everybody behaves that way. It's just water is the one we can see the easiest. And as a matter of fact, they do Celsius. The, the, the measuring on Celsius, not Fahrenheit, Celsius. The zero is when we go right between liquid and solid at sea level. And 100 degrees is between liquid and gas when it steams off. So that's why it's kind of nice to use Celsius in chemistry and all that and no Fahrenheit because it's got, I don't know, do you know the logic of Fahrenheit, anybody? See, and you a lot of you come from, you're still, you know, I don't know. Um, energy is what, if, what moves matter. It doesn't have a mass, it doesn't have weight. It has an effect on matter. It does something to matter. It has an ability to, to work, to put matter into motion. So that's like you blow up, you know, the balloon thing. We have two types of energy. We have kinetic energy, or we have potential energy. Kinetic energy is when we move. That's where the balloon comes in. So this is kinetic energy. The, ball, the air goes out, and the, the car moves forward. So there's movement happening. It's a muscle is moving, or the river is flowing. Potential energy is the dam with the water. It's not flowing, it's stuck there. In here, we, we blow up the balloon before we let it go. It's potential energy in that balloon, the compressed air, that then you know, lets it go out. Uh, in our body, that can be our fat reserves. That's potential energy. Even the ATP molecule, the energy molecule, which we get to today, or maybe next time, we'll have to see. But that's uh, potential energy. So that's stored energy. That's inactive. But we can use it for later, for later on. There's, you know, battery. That's the classic example. And from there, we, 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 we look at the forms of energy. We have different forms. We have electricity. That's charged particles. That's the energy. That's in the body, we have ions. We're going to talk about ions. That's, a, that's the calcium ion, the sodium, the salt. That's that electro, when you, when you, you sweat, is that stuff, the salty stuff. So that's, that can have charged, it's charged molecules, so that can conduct electricity a little bit. It's a flow of electrons and electricity. We have radiant energy, that's light energy, such as visible light, or X-rays, chemical energy, that's stored in substances, molecular bond, which then need to be broken down to release energy. That's what happens when we eat. The food goes into all the little particles that then go into energy in the body that then we can use to do work or exercise, stuff like that. 
I like this. This is very nice how it breaks it down. That's your fundamental. <coughs> Skulls get smaller, broken down, that's digestion. Then gets assimilated and then into the cell and it, it assimilated to the bloodstream. Actually, that's still here, but still at the, the molecular level. And then from there, we make energy out of it, the ATP, and that's potential energy. And then with that, we can do active energy. That could be thinking, but also exercise. And then we got mechanical energy, and that's the movement of a muscle, for example. Moving something. When we convert energy from one form to another, we can do that very easily. We can take ATP and we can do work. Let's turn on a muscle, move, make it work. Um, what happens, though, is we lose something in it, process, and what we lose is heat. We know that with the light bulb, at least the old ones, you, is it too hot to turn it yet? When it goes out? So that's a lot of heat. In the body, you know, the muscle, it's perfect. I like this little, how the monkey uses energy conversion to leap from tree to tree. So we get solar energy, does the banana tree leaf, goes into the, the leaves, makes bananas, the, the monkey can eat the bananas, gives chemical energy in the carbohydrate stored in the banana, that's the sugar, carbohydrate. Makes a happy monkey, and then that will be broken down into glucose, that's the sugar molecule. As a mo carbohydrates is a lot of sugar combined together as a whole macro food, as a food group. Glucose is one of the single carbohydrates, the molecules. Actually, glucose is the one that then goes into the cell, and the cell makes energy out of it. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Well, it already talks about actually uh, mechanical energy right here. When you contract, and then the monkey can move from tree to tree. In between here, we make the glucose, we make it into ATP, and then that makes it into a contraction. Yeah, I was very happy when I found that. <laughs> Explains it real nice. So, energy, matter. Make sense? I know the first few chapters are sort of abstract, but on Monday we'll talk, we'll do the biochemistry, the organic chemistry, we'll talk about that in terms of food stuff. So that'll make it a bit more palatable. Um, moving right along, when we start creating the world, the matter of the world, now we go back to matter, not energy. Uh, we have to look at the smallest little particles that make up our planet, and we come up with this word atoms. And atoms mean incapable of dividing. We know now there is a little bit more to that than that, but for our purposes, that's perfect. We don't need more, no more than that. So we have a, a limited number of those substances, or those elements, uh, uh, and these are right here in the periodic table. Here's a periodic table. That's all the elements that are made up, make up our universe. <clears throat> There's a lot of them. This is actually a nice chart. Um, when we go deeper into one of these elements, we look at one of those elemental particles, we're going to find the structure of an atom. So one of these is called an atom, one of these little things. Each of these little things looks similar, as in it has different things to it, but the amounts of these little substances it has, these structures are different, and so that makes it a different element. And so each atom contains a centerpiece, and that's a nucleus, and it contains orbits, and uh, that's already dead. <laughs> That's no need more and more, more. I guess I left it open. Orbits and that stuff, like in the sun and the planets, that floats around the center point. <coughs> the nucleus, when you look at the nucleus, we got two different color things here. We got blue and we got yellow. So we got two different types of little particles, little smaller particles that you have. And one is called a proton. 
and the other one is called a neutron. The proton and the neutron are the same size, but they have a different charge. One of them has a positive charge, and that's the proton. The proton has a positive charge. And the neutron, look at the name, it's neutral, so it has no charge, no charge, no charge. But they are both having a little size to it, so those small little particles. Around them are floating negative charged little particles, but those are, they have no weight to them, they have no physicalness to them. We just draw them on so we can see that what we're doing. So the orbital model is that, but later on then, they started just making electron clouds. They call it clouds, and so they use different terminology. But this is fine for us. I don't want to go deeper than that. But what's important, they have a negative charge. All right, so that's very important. So we have now protons, neutrons, and electrons. They're called electrons. Positive charge, no charge, negative charge. You know about positive and negative stuff, right? The duality thing. It's always like magnets. It's all, it's all in this duality. Dying day at night, North Pole, South Pole. I'm sure it comes from all of that. So now, what we can do is we can take these different atoms and we can group them together, make a, a molecule. We can bond them together, so they have to hold hands. They have to interact with one another. And so that gives us chemical reactions. They occur when atoms combine with each other or dissociate from one another. And when that happens, we call that metabolism. We talked about that as one of the necessary life functions, metabolism. It's chemical reactions. And that's really from our perspective, when we go deeper there, since we have these molecules or atoms that are bonded together, the connection between the atoms is going to be what creates these reactions. So we're going to have to talk about what makes these bonds, what makes these reactions, what makes these connections happen. And so a chemical bond is, a, is, a, is an attraction between atoms and that helps us make a chemical compound or a molecule. <clears throat> and bonds, when we go deeper and look at that, are interactions between electrons of reacting atoms. So now we go back to this one, where we have the core, the nucleus, and the electrons, the orbits going around, the chemical reactions are happening with these things floating around. The nucleus is not touched by that. It makes sense, you know. It's like, you, you know, you wouldn't want to have two solar systems come together at the sun's top. First, the outer planets start having issues with each other or banging into each other or something like that. Um, or liking it. And so that's what makes the bonds. That's what creates the reactions, is this electron stuff. And so let's talk a little more about these electrons because. We, we have this orbital model, and orbits means different rings around a center. I think that's what it is. Um, so we have these different rings, and on these different rings we have these electrons situated. Um, <clears throat> and the rings start from the inside out, but the one that's most, most important for us is what's called the valence. And the valence is the outermost of those rings, the outermost of those orbits. And so this, the valence electrons, the ones on the outermost shell, are the ones that will interact with another atom's valence electrons. So therefore, the valence determines the chemical reactivity of an atom, because that's what interacts. So the outermost shell Whatever's going on there is what we're interested in. And there, here, if you do, if you like chemistry, as you can tell, I'm medium on it. I like biomechanics. But on these um, periodic tables, all these numbers, these are small little numbers, 
Uh, I put a, a, a still picture in where you can sort of see what sort of these numbers mean. These, this means that the valence electron is the outermost, the last of these numbers. So the first is always having two electrons, and then we have multiple electrons, and then the outermost, for the most part, for us that's enough, the most part, is, the, is, is uh, known as the valence. And that one always wants to have, for us always, wants to have eight electrons in it. And so if the outermost valence, the outermost orbit of these electrons, the valence, has eight in it, it's happy. It wants to have eight in it. That's called the octet rule. So that's a good one to remember. So it wants to have eight in it. If it's got eight in it, if it's like all these floaty around things, and the outermost has eight in it, it's happy. It doesn't want to interact, because that's the one that interacts. If it doesn't have eight in it, if it has seven in it, or one, like this one, it wants to interact. Yeah, this is salt, this is um, sodium. So this, see, this only has one on top. So that's interaction material. If we have eight, we don't worry about interacting. And so some of those elements, if they're actually on the right side of the periodic table, they're called inert elements. So they're just happy. I put them all here, helium, neon, argon, krypton, all these weird names. These are really, we don't need them for the body, that's just so we finish the storyline in terms of the reactivity. Because now, how the heck are we gonna react? So we got this understanding that electrons in an atom interact with other electrons of another atom to make a molecule. We know that the outermost shell of these electrons, well, we know that an atom has a core and orbits around it, and we know that the orbits, the shells where the electrons sit, those interact with the other atoms. And we also know that it's the outermost of those shells, the valence, and we also know it's the number eight. So we've got eight, we're happy, we don't have eight, we want to do something. Now we can do two things with that, doing something. We can either transfer an electron from one atom to another atom, like give it to me, and it sucks it out. And so this, this one needs one, this atom needs one, this atom doesn't care having that one, so this has, this sometimes, like this has eight, seven in it, in its valence, and this has one in its valence, so it's easy to just transfer. It was like, steal me or give it to me. So that's one way we can deal with that. The other way we can deal with that is we can share electrons between the atoms and hold hands and make bonds that way. So that's the second one. We go, let's say we go four here and four here or six here and two here. We want to share stuff with each other. I don't know, more like, more like we got six and six and we say, oh, if I get two more from you, I'm happy. But we don't do the two transfers. We just hold hands with one another and share them. Then we make eight out of them. So the first one, the stealing one, is known as an ionic bond. And in our body, that makes charged molecules. Because if you throw that into water, into liquid, and our body is pretty much liquid, it dissociates and makes ions. So that's your salt, sodium. That's a, every, every molecule, everything you see when it's described is a positive or a negative on top. Like Na positive, then you know it has a charge, then you know it's from an ionic bond. Then we know it's an electrolyte. These make electrolytes. This is your table salt. You put salt in the liquid, it dissolves. In liquid, they dissolve. They don't hold hands. They're not together. The covalent bonds, they are together. They are much, much more stable. They hold hands. They hold all of those. You can put them in liquid. It doesn't matter. That's going to be a lot of our macromolecules, our fats and our proteins and glucose and all that. So that's the two main bonds that we talk about, that we worry about in chemistry. Not more than that. Ionic and covalent. The covalent comes a little bit more complex. 
Some covalent bond molecules are nicely, they're, they're non-polar. They don't have more pulling of an electron on one molecule or on one atom than on another atom. But some of them have a little bit of a tension in it. So one, one atom is a little bit more stronger in the pulling force of the negative electron than the other one. This is water. Water is one of those molecules. So water has a, has, is a kind of a tense molecule that way. And you can see that when you see a water, uh, something walking on water, it doesn't just break through. It has a little bit of a tension. These molecules interact with other ones of these molecules because the positivity of the molecule will be attracted to the negativity of another molecule. So these are not atoms making bonds to then make a molecule. That would be making the water molecule. These are water molecules interacting with each other and sort of creating a lattice of tension. Now that's very important in the body. For example, that's a reason why a baby, a preemie baby, has not been viable for a many years until they figured out how to, in the lungs, get the water film on the lungs not to be so tense that it collapses the air sacs and doesn't let them expand. And in our lungs, we have this thing called surfactant, which disperses water molecules and makes the tension less strong. And until the body can make that, the baby was never viable. Now we have synthetics of those, babies are viable. Of course, that happened in the 60s, so you probably don't remember it, but that was one way where this stuff matters in the body. So when we take water molecules and we put them together, we make a little bit more of a bond, a very, very weak bond, uh, that is sometimes within molecules. Like you have a protein, and the protein is a wiggled up structure that's three-dimensional. Within that protein, you have a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of no molecules that are attached to one another uh, uh, covalently. And then within that chain, you also have attractions of different molecules that come together that have polarities to them. And what they do is they create a, that little attraction bond, and that's called a hydrogen bond. That was complicated. You get that? Good. Jesus Christ. I must get tired already. So the positive and negative poles of a polar covalent molecules are attracted to each other, forming weak connections. That was much better. Uh, they often form bonds inside larger molecules called intramolecular bonds, such as in proteins, that's what I try to explain, and also, of course, in uh, our DNA uh, uh, double helix. Have you seen this kind of molecule before? That thing going on? Yeah. So it's kind of like two, two str strands and a, a lattice in between, and the in between has the hydrogen bonds in it a lot of times. Because when we, this is the gene stuff, this is a cookbook for all the proteins. And all these little rungs mean something when we make proteins. And we'll talk about what that means. It's actually really interesting. It's not even that complicated. But when we copy this material, when we divide cells, for example, or we want to make protein, we have to unzip these ladders in between. And so they have hydrogen bonds in between. And so they're fairly easy to break and then fairly easy to come back together because they're attractions. So that's kind of cool. So now we know chemical reactions happen on bonds, happen with bonds, which is that electron interaction stuff. And so when we figure out what kind of chemical reactions do we have? Well, we, we got to have some that make bonds. We're going to have some that break bonds for the most part. So we have some um, that we call a decomposition reaction that we make smaller molecules from larger bonds. That when we break them down, we break bonds. We know that as a catabolic reaction or destructive reaction. You know, that's when you take your, you know, your sledgehammer and you break down the shed because you build a new one. That's destruction. But that's the same thing. You're breaking things down. It releases energy in the body. That releases energy. That's when we take the, 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 the bread, we eat it, we make glucose, we get the energy from glucose. Digestion of food into the building block. So that's the composition reaction, breaking bonds. Then synthesis reaction is making large molecules from smaller ones. So that is an anabolic process. That's why we use the term anabolic steroid. Building muscle, right? So that's always easy to remember because everybody knows that word. It's a constructive process. You're making a house. You're making muscle. You're building things. 
when you do that, you use energy. Think, you know, build a house takes a lot of energy. I was watching this, this building house channel. I'm like, oh, well, I'm not doing that. Um, growth, repair, etc. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Growth and repair are one of issues. And then we have a third um, a reaction type, and that's an exchange reaction or a replacement reaction. And so sometimes in the body, what we do, we, we just exchange molecules. We have two, two molecules, and we exchange a little atom stuff, little particles between them. So for example, you've got glucose that travel in the bloodstream, and, and, and the insulin is helpful as a hormone to take the glucose out of the bloodstream, put the glucose into the cells. But all the insulin does, it's a hormone, it goes to a, a, a receptor on a channel that's in a, in a cell membrane for the cell to open and then lay glucose into the cell from the bloodstream. It's passive, it doesn't, it doesn't just ship it in. But what the glucose does, as soon as it goes into the cell, it gets a little bit altered. It doesn't look like glucose anymore when it's a little bit altered. And then, whenever another glucose goes by, it's not like all of a sudden, it's like, oh, we already have enough glucose in there. It's like the cell thinks it doesn't have any glucose in there yet because it's, it's a, when you look at concentrations of molecules, it's now a different molecule. It's not the same molecule. And so the glucose still gets sucked into the cell and the receptor opens the channel. But the only time it doesn't do it when the receptor closes the channel, when the receptor is gone. And that means when the insulin is no longer on the receptor, then it closes that channel. But so that's one place where we use that. We don't really talk much about this at all. So we didn't quite get that as well. But it's one that helps us a lot. What we most need to remember on this is the decomposition, the synthesis. I like these catabolic, anabolic eyes. These, these terms are sort of nicely spelled out here. We come back to those over and over. Um, and so it's a foundation. What influences chemical reactions? Well, a few things. Temperature, when it gets hotter, everything bounces faster and more, and uh, things bump into each other more, and there's more possibility for these outer bonds to react. Concentration, yeah, the more atoms, the more chance of interaction. Makes sense. Particle size, the smaller the particle, the faster it moves, the more possibility of banging into things and making interactions happen. And then this is the funny one, the biological catalyst. So that is an enzyme that can control the rate of a reaction. So an enzyme is a helper to make a chemical reaction happen. And so what it does is, is, is chemical reactions happen on bonds. And so an enzyme, the green thing is an enzyme, has a, an active place, a, a site that is, is it's, it's looks. I mean, it's, it's physical shape. It's the square, the round thing. Does it fit into each other? And it has this specific shape for a specific molecule to be able to go into it, to be able to connect to it. And then this is a these are two end, these are two molecules, probably a disaccharide or something, uh, and has a bond, has bonds in here between. And then the enzyme goes and nags on that bond and breaks it and releases it once it's broken. So this reaction might happen anyway. This reaction actually happens when you cook an egg. You put the thing in, the, it's actually, the, no, it's the, it's the protein uh, that teenagers tell you, but you put the egg into the pan, you, you open it, and it's all clear, and then after a little bit, it gets white. That's that process. You denature the protein, you destroy the protein. It could be done with an enzyme, but he can do it also. Except in the body, it would be hard to have all these little heat plates and figure out which chemical reaction you go faster and which not. So we have these enzymes, these chemical helpers, that for any given molecular reaction, we have a specific enzyme that helps make that reaction go forward or not go forward. Because I can change the enzyme a little bit and then it's not functioning, for example. And that way I can control a lot of how things work in the body. And so when we technically look at this, we have this graph that has these are the reactants. So these are these two things here, right? The reactants. And in space, in just solution, at some point, there will be the chemical reaction. But it takes a lot of starting energy, activation energy, so starting energy. And the enzyme, what it does, it's said to be lowering that activation energy. 
when we look at it at a graph. And the chemical reactions are moving forward without having to put in all this. This could be heat, that, that energy. That could be heat. And so enzymes do, you know, you don't. You know, you, you don't have the enzyme that, 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 that the, the milk sugar one. What is that called? The lactase? And you drink milk? You know what enzymes don't do. They're going to blow you up, but it's not pretty. So then, you know, and then you eat some digestive enzymes and you go like, damn, everything feels good. You know what those puppies do. They're very happy makers. Enzymes are our friends. Oh, look at that. That's pretty good. We're already at this level. What time is it? Oh, wow, I've got way more to go. That brings us to biochemistry. Biochemistry. The chemistry of life. Look, that's life. We still have it. We haven't quite figured it out how to destroy it completely yet. Um, life on Earth is carbon-based. A lot of carbons. A lot of carbons. Carbon, 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 carbon. Sugar has a carbon ring. The fats are carbon chains. A lot of carbons. And those are our organic molecules. So they're large and they have carbon in it, organic molecules. That's a lot of that macromolecules. The carbohydrate, look, they're all here. Carbs, God, these are good pictures, huh? I don't know, there's hours on Google, which picture would look good? Carbs, protein, fat, and that's the DNA. So that's organic stuff. Then we have, in biochemistry, in the body, biochemistry means body. Bio means actually two. Bio means two. And this part of, talks about part is talking about the duality as a word. But when we talk biochemistry, it means the stuff inside the body. And so we also have inorganic. We also have inorganic molecules in there, and those are small, and they mostly do not contain carbon. Very good example of that. Agua mineral. Water. We can go right to the water. Two thirds of our body is water. So we can stop right here and we already learned two thirds of the body. This is pretty good, huh? Up to about the armpit, from all the way down here, is pretty much liquid. So that's why we should drink a bunch. And it's not easy. I've been, I got through a liter and some, and now I have to finish up the rest when I get home. Um, we have a few reasons why water is so cool. For once, water has a high heat capacity. That means it can absorb and release large amounts of energy before it changes temperature much. This prevents sudden heat changes in the body. We know that we're fuel very well. You're living in on the coast or you're living inland. You got the ocean, the coast's balanced. The inland, in the winter, in the night, it's freaking cold. And it gets warmer, and in the summer it's boiling up because it's like the desert. The heat and the cold are much more extreme, and we don't have a body of water around. And so, in the body, it's just, in our body, it's the same thing. And so, it balances out the temperature that way. It's 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 polar. We just talked about that hydrogen bomb. That's that polarity. It's got this uneasiness, and that helps it be a great solvent. So it's great in dissolving solids. It's great trans a great transport medium. That's why the first medicine is water. If you're sick, because whatever else we take, if we don't have the solvent property of water, we don't utilize all the other stuff so efficiently. I mean, there's other reasons for having digestive problems and all that stuff, but if there's no water, that's the first problem. And chemical reactivity, almost all chemical reactions depend on water. I think we come up with that. So you need water for pretty much all the chemical reactivity. That's the other reason why we want to drink the damn thing. And then cushioning. It provides cushioning, for example, around the brain. Very liquid, a liquid film. Oh, question. Uh, does it matter what the temperature of your body is? Yeah, do not cold. Yeah. You know that ice thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, no, no cold. Best is body temperature, actually. Mm -hmm. See, I'm lucky. I got a break freeze. 
very fast. No, apparently these two guys in the 1800 somethings they had in Boston, they were frozen lakes and they figured, what are we going to do with this water, with this ice? They started cutting it and shipping it around the world for ice drinks and stuff. So it was a business opportunity. And so people, it's not, no, the cold water is unfortunately, um, it's nice if it's 100 degrees outside, but it's, we, it's the same. The one time we should be a little careful with drinking too much water is when we eat. Because you don't want to dilute too much the, ke the chemical mixture in the stomach that digests the food, the liquids that, you know, believe they do that. So that's interesting too. So then, you know, I think, if, well, I shouldn't say that, but you know, if you need to have cold water, you just sip a little bit. By the time it gets down there, it's warm already. Yep, water. You need to drink it. Very cool stuff. Uh, salts, salts. We just we talked about these ions. So ion bonded molecules dissociate in water and creating ions, which are is an electrolyte solution. Very important for nerve impulse, electricity, and also is part of the hemoglobin. For example, the iron in the hemoglobin. Electrolytes, oh, look here, this is a hemoglobin. That's like this wiggly thing is a protein. We're going to talk about the proteins probably next time. The proteins are long beads of similar molecules, these amino acids. And then they wiggle up and wiggle up and wiggle up a few times, and then they create these kind of looking things. And that's a hemoglobin. And in the hemoglobin in the middle, we have that heme, that iron thing. And that's the, uh, the, the, the um, ion, and that's the piece that attracts the oxygen. So the oxygen then carries there. So that's cool. Energy levels that can drop as you become dehydrated. That was that discussion about the Gators, the Gatorade. That's the Gatorade. When you don't drink, replenish your electrolytes. Here are our main ones. We have sodium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, potassium. These are the body ones. I'm not sure I make you memorize them. I don't think so. For the test. But you can look them up. Part of why you want to have these kind of books is you look stuff up. You know? So you don't, as I always thought, oh, I got to remember everything. And to some level, I mean, that's what the, they think. But I don't think in anatomy you're going to be able to retain everything. You're gonna lose, drop things. The concepts, they stay, but some of the words, they go like, oh, I don't know, do you have to do them a few, few times? Especially the muscles and bones stuff. But, so don't feel bad if it's overwhelming. Just stick with the program and we'll, we'll, we'll get the first round through and make it as fun as possible. So that's the salt. So we have water, we have salts, and then we also have acids and bases. And those are a little more complicated. They're similar to salts, they dissociate when placed in the water. So they're like ions that dissociate. But now they, they, they release, they're not ions that are released. Well, they are, but they're hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions, which actually, if you combine them, they make water, H2O. But the molecule that you put in water that releases a hydrogen ion when it's placed in water is known as an acid. Because we have too many hydrogen ions in solution, we're gonna have a problem. That's the acidity. That, you know, drink lemon juice and then sniff Windex. <laughs> Total the extremes, right? So the lemon juice is the acid more, the Windex is more of the hydroxyl ions, the other ones that get released in solution. So that smells a little bit different. Um, when we look at a language, an acid is known as a proton donor because a hydrogen ion is the same as a proton. And the base is known as a proton acceptor or a hydroxyl ion. No, they don't say that. Hydroxyl ion. That, that, if you don't get that, that's okay. That's okay. We're not going to go too deep with the language. But what I need you to know is the fact that we put an acid in a solution into the body the hydrogen ion gets released and that can cause problems. If the concentration of hydrogen ions are too big in the body, too great, we're going to have issues. And that brings us to pH. 
So the body is very, very fine-tuned of what is normal. A very small range. When we look at pH, which is our measuring for that acid-base stuff, we use that, we look at <clears throat> the concentration of active hydroxyl ions, but we want to see that hydrogen ion. But that's why it's inversely proportioned. So a pH of one is very acidic. So that means I put that thing, look, lemon juice, I don't know what that is. But lemon juice is two, that's pretty acidic. You put that in solution, a lot of hydrogen ions get released. Seven is neutral, 14 is a strong base. That's your ammonia stuff as well. Our body can only be at about 7.4. Not seven, 7.4. 7 so we're that narrow in what we can handle. Otherwise, not good. Alkalosis, acidosis, diabetes problems. So when you have somebody laying on the floor and they have a fruity breath, that's the acidosis stuff. Problematic. So very narrow range that we can accept. And so we need, that's what, what we need to know um, in terms of the, 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 the acid base. The, the acid, the release of hydrogen ions, too much of the concentration of hydrogen ions makes us acid inside of the body. That's a pathology problem. We don't want that. So what we have in the system, we have weak acids and weak bases that can use to balance the pH. So they can pick up or exp they can pick up excessive hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions. So you put them in into uh, the solution and they they buffer the hydrogen ions out. So we get a chemical equilibrium the, between a carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, and bicarbonate, which is a weak base, resists changes in the block pH by shifting the curve from hydrogen ions to hydroxyl ions left to right, whatever is necessary. And so that's a buffer, and a chemical buffer. And we have a couple different ones in a, in, a, in, a, in a body, but one is really strong, and that's that bicarbonate ion. Have you ever did Alka-Seltzer? That's a bicarbonate ion, and aspirin. But that's what absorbs the acid in the stomach, so you know, your hangover ain't that bad, or whatever it is. For me, it's a hangover. Um, and that, that thing is a, is a, has a negative on it, so its ability has to pick up that positive hydrogen ion. And so it helps us absorb bicarbonate ions in the system, helps us absorb excessive ions, de changing the pH, make it more like what we can handle versus too acidic. And then it becomes, a, and that thing is interesting, chemically, when an arrow goes both ways, it means the shifting goes both directions, the chemical reaction goes both directions. And um, that's the other, um, th you don't have to, Memorize carbonic acid, that's the other molecule. Bicarbonate ion, that's a good one to know, actually, because yeah, it's in acid. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's in our meds sometimes. So that's a good one. So that's chemical buffers. Good. And I'm just going to go uh, to about here on this. I'm not sure if you did these questions yet. Did you do these questions yet? No? You stop right there? Okay, then um, let's stop right there. And I will go to that stuff. That stuff is cool. That's when it gets more lively, more what we need for our body. So with that then, do you have any questions? Is that sort of clear or is just all over? Is I'm too much all over the place? It's pretty straightforward? So far so good? If you have questions, do not hesitate, come to me. No question is not allowed to ask. If you feel overwhelmed, come talk to me. We'll make something happen. We'll figure it out. Sometimes this material is, with the language, it can be hard the first couple of chapters because I talk a lot and, and it's mostly that kind of stuff. When we get to muscle and bones, if your first language is a Roman language, you're in all good shape. If it's English, you're screwed. 